Greetings, everyone, um, uh, who's here in person, uh, and to those of us, those of you joining us on the live stream, welcome. Uh, thank you for taking some time out of your evening to, to join us tonight. As you'll learn in just a moment, we've been waiting for this day actually for quite a long time, and so we're, we're, we're quite excited for it. Uh, my name is Reed Lachlan, and I am, uh, for one semester at least, the coordinator of the Christianity and Culture Program here at St. Michael's College. Um, and I want to start by acknowledging that we, we're gathered here on the territory, territory of Treaty 13, the Toronto Purchase, negotiated first in 1805 and only brought to a conclusive settlement uh, in 2010. So as treaty peoples, we begin our event with an acknowledgement of this land. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of St. Michael's College operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So thanks again to everyone for coming. Um, thanks to the principal. We have actually several principals of St. Michael's <laughs> College here, and so we're grateful to all of them, and also to our many generous donors uh, for supporting this lecture series. The Langan Lectures are dedicated to the legacy and now the memory of our beloved Emerita faculty colleague and program founder, Professor Janine Langan. We lost Janine tragically on December 11th, 2021. Between the time that this lecture was originally planned and an invitation offered, and the time now when we were finally able to, to bring it to fruition. And we're really privileged today to be joined by, by Mark Langan, um, Janine's son, and uh, I think that I think you're the only Langan in present at the moment. Yeah. Um, and Mark actually told us that um, this is a particularly suitable and auspicious date to have this lecture because uh, yesterday, I think, was Janine's birthday. Um, and so, so we're here to celebrate Janine in a special way. Uh, if you don't know, uh, many of you probably do, Janine was an inspired educator who founded the Christianity and Culture Program in 1979. In a recent issue of the journal Logos, uh, Father Robert Berenger suggested that in her teaching and leadership, Janine was, quote, able to win a hearing for what church might come to mean in the climate of the 80s for her students, Catholic and non-Catholic alike. He quotes student testimonies. She introduced me to a church that was passionate, intellectual, socially just, creative, and complex. Christianity and culture introduced people to the treasures of the church. It awakened the spirit of the church for people. So Janine offered St. Mike's a profound vision of Christianity, of culture, and of the possibilities of creative encounter. Arguably, fewer Canadian academics better embody scholarly questions of creative encounter than our speaker this year, uh, Professor Emma Anderson. Anderson is Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Ottawa, where she teaches undergraduate and graduate students in English and French. She completed her bachelor's degree at Carleton University, and from there went on to master's and doctoral studies at Harvard University. It turns out we were both in Boston uh, at around the same time in our studies, we've discovered. Um, an expert on the religious encounter between Catholic missionaries and indigenous peoples in colonial North America, Professor Anderson is the author of over 20 articles and book chapters, as well as two award-winning books published by Harvard University Press. Her first book, The Betrayal of Faith, The Tragic Journey of a Colonial Native Convert, explores the momentous transatlantic transformation of an indigenous boy, Pierre Antoine Paste de Chouin. Her second book, The Death and Afterlife of the North American Martyrs, critically examines the lives and deaths of eight slain Jesuits in the 1640s and probes the ongoing consequences of their veneration for Indigenous peoples. Her presentation tonight, Dawn in the West, How the Thought of Indigenous People Ushered in Modernity, presents the thesis of the book that she is currently writing. And so we're privileged to get this first sort of uh, privileged peak uh, into the work that's, a, that's about to see the light of day. So please join me in welcoming Professor Emma Anderson. <laughs> 
Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, indigenous people, though decimated by the diseases accompanying contact and systematically robbed of much of their land base, won the war of ideas with their European interlocutors, not just once, but twice. Tonight, I will argue that the last 400 years have witnessed two great waves of indigenous influence that have fundamentally transformed Western culture. First, in the 17th and 18th centuries came an epistemic wave in which indigenous peoples taught the West how to think, ushering in the Enlightenment. Then, in the 19th century, a second ontological wave began to build as belatedly the rest of the world began to catch up with their precocious modernity. This wave is cresting in our own times as traditional indigenous thought offers both inspiration and hope for a world on fire. As a professor of North American religious history, I've spent much of the last 17 years of my career introducing my students to the fateful meeting of Catholic missionaries and the indigenous nations of Northeastern North America during the 17th century. Repeatedly, I have been struck by how these 21st century young people, regardless of their own religious, cultural, and ethnic backgrounds, seem instinctively to relate to the values and perspectives of these early modern native peoples much more readily than they do to those of European Christians of the same era early modernity, we're talking 16th to 18th century here. Over the years, I've gradually become convinced that students apparently intuitive grasp of these indigenous perspectives, particularly their religious relativism, intellectual independence, disdain for coercion, and proto-scientific evidentialism represent something more than simply white liberal guilt or the powerful glamour of the underdog in a Canadian society striving to become post-colonial. Slowly, I began to realize that my students relate to the Indigenous people of this era because they were recognizably modern in a way that Europeans were not, not yet. But how 17th century Indigenous people thought and what they thought anticipated in almost every respect developments that would arrive in Europe only with the Enlightenment and would find their fullest expression only in our own times. Tonight, I will chart these two great tidal waves of Indigenous influence on the West. The first part of my talk will explore Indigenous epistemic influences, how to think, upon European thought in 18th century France. It will be organized into three sections. First, I will introduce our 16th and 17th century European writers on contact. Explorers such as Jacques Cartier, colonists such as Samuel de Champlain, Catholic missionaries such as Paul Lejeune, Jean de Brébeuf, Marie de l'Incarnation, and Gabriel Sagard, adventurers such as the Baron de la Hontan and Marc Lescarbo, even former captives of the native nations that they wrote about, such as Pierre Esprit Razin, who recorded their conversations and encounters with indigenous peoples for posterity. Because Indigenous peoples were largely orally based, we lack written records, of course, presenting independent Indigenous perceptions of contact. Then I will describe the speakers, their native interlocutors, and their European readers, those in France and wider Europe who read, absorbed, and were profoundly influenced by the revolutionary modernity of Indigenous worldviews. So first, our writers. The people who wrote about this, uh, their encounters with many indigenous nations of Northeastern North America were a variegated lot. Until 1627, when non-Catholics were forbidden to emigrate, they were both Catholic and Protestant. Until 1639, when the Ursulines and Hospitalier nuns responded to the urgent calls of their brothers in the faith, they were largely male. Helpfully for historians, these writers had a wide diversity of perspectives on the colonial project, ranging from upbeat jingoism, Champlain, to impassioned criticism, particularly of the influence of the Jesuits in the writings of La Hontan, who would greatly influence Voltaire. 
Differences in confession, background, educational level, contrasting programs for colonization, and rivalries between religious orders add complexity and diversity to these sources. Our European writers wrote for a range of reasons. One of the most prosaic was simply that they were mandated to provide systematic information at regular intervals to their superiors in the old world. These often took the form of lengthy annual reports that not only documented the principal events that had occurred during the previous year, but communicated new information gleaned about everything from the climate and growing season to local flora and fauna to the beliefs and practices of Indigenous people. Some of these colonial works were written with publication in mind, but others became accidental bestsellers, like the Jesuit Relations, which were published every year in Paris from 1632 to 1673, which is a pretty good run. Though originally penned strictly for the internal consumption of the Jesuit leadership in France, these powerful, evocative narratives about life in an unknown, faraway land were enjoyed by a wide reading public because they provided fascinating glimpses of worlds that most would never see. The relations created a considerable revenue stream for the Jesuits and gave them a commanding recruitment, publicity, and fundraising tool. Understanding the demography of New France is essential to comprehending the particular context of contact here. This was a world dominated in almost every respect, certainly demographically, by Indigenous people. French colonization of North America was numerically a tiny affair. Noting Spanish losses in European land wars following massive emigration to the New World, the cautious French responded with a model of colonization that stressed utilizing the populations already present, Indigenous peoples, as living place markers for their own imperial presence. If Indigenous peoples could be convinced to show a temporal loyalty to the French crown and a spiritual attachment to the papal tiara, they would be French enough, the theory went, to hold this section of the continent for their self-styled mother country. The 1666 census counted only 3,215 French souls in the territories optimistically called New France. These small numbers contrasted Spanish patterns, but also those of neighboring New England, where colonists typically emigrated in family groups. French intent in colonization also differed starkly from the Spanish and the English, whereas the Spanish launched large scale wars of conquest against indigenous empires in Central and South America, and the English sought to convert what they saw as a howling wilderness into a garden by bringing acres under the plow. The French program was one of economic exploitation of natural resources furs using the expertise of indigenous people. This reliance upon the economic cooperation of demographically dominant indigenous nations gave French colonism, colonialism its special flavor, forcing colonists, explorers, and missionaries alike onto what historian Richard White has termed the middle ground, a terrain of compromise and of wary mutual respect. Aside from missionaries, most French immigrants favored keeping indigenous cultures the way they were for the simple reason that they were reliant upon indigenous know-how for fur extraction. If anything, most of the cultural change went the other direction as these largely male French immigrants readily adapted indigenous languages, technologies such as snowshoes and canoes, and social mores such as marriage à la façon de la pays to Indigenous women, which offered them not only the obvious comforts of companionship, but also the social and economic advantages of acceptance uh, by Native communities in a kind of adoption by marriage. Missionary motives for being in North America, on the other hand, were profoundly influenced by both the evangelical imperative 
the commandment to pass on the glory of the gospel to all humanity, and by decades of confessional warfare in a fractured Europe. The conviction of both Catholics and Protestants that they alone possessed a singular truth bred both a willingness to kill and a willingness to die for one's faith. The Reformation ushered in a new golden age of Christian martyrdom, unprecedented since the persecution of early Christians by the Romans, but in which Christians took starring roles as both the torturers and the tortured. This situation led to something of an arms race in which the confessional tensions of Europe were transferred to the New World. Catholic monoliths like Spain and France and Protestant powers like the Netherlands and England dreamed of a pristine new world in which their own faith would dominate unchallenged, far removed from the fracturing and battle scars of a divided Europe. For Catholics in particular, this was a powerfully attractive vision. Traumatized by the Protestant Reformation, as well as other massive conceptual adjustments like heliocentrism and the discovery of the Americas itself, Catholics came here seeking an infusion of new blood into their spiritual body, exsanguinated by their demographic losses to the Protestant cause. To their desire to save native people from the fires of an eternal hell, to which their ignorance of the gospel had damned them, was added then a more self-interested motivation. Though a motley crew then, our 17th century writers were strikingly uniform in one fascinating respect. Their thinking, though ethnocentric, was not racist. Though they generally saw Indigenous culture as inferior to their own, they did not see Indigenous people themselves as in any way lacking, or indeed as being in any way ethnically or racially distinctive. For missionaries, the problem with Indigenous people was simply the fact that they were not yet Christian, a flaw that they set out to fix through a determined campaign of conversion. Initially, Catholic missionaries targeted Indigenous children rather than adults for conversion, reasoning that they were more impressionable and would, as they rose to maturity and leadership, bring their peoples under the Christian yoke from within. Quote, the fathers would be taught through the children, unquote. The first residential schools then were founded in Canada, not in the 1840s and 50s, but in the 1620s and 30s. In addition to these domestic experiments, Indigenous children and adolescents were also sent to France for baptism and schooling. In fact, this was the subject of my first book about Pierre-Antoine Pastadechouan, one of the first residential school students in Angers, France. Uh, but by the 1640s and 50s, missionaries came to the reluctant conclusion that early that separating children from their families and communities to educate them was not only inefficacious, but cruel, and began to target influential adults within the community and through ritual rather than education instead. Missionaries, colonists, and explorers alike then tended to downplay physiological differences between themselves and Indigenous people. The typically browner skin of Indigenous folks was attributed to their greater exposure to the sun, much like the sun-kissed peasants of the Mediterranean, with whom they were often favorably compared. Mark Lescarbeau, a Protestant, stated that, quote, they are all of an olive color, much like the Spaniards, unquote. Writing in 1635, uh, the irascible Jesuit missionary Paul Lejeune said, quote, you see well-formed men, good-looking, a fine figure, strong, powerful. Their skin is naturally white, for the little children show it thus, but the heat of the sun and the rubbing with seal oil and moose fat makes them very swarthy, the more so, as they grow older. Elsewhere, he added, quote, I naturally compare our savages with certain villagers, because both are usually without education. Though our peasants are superior in this regard, 
And yet I have not seen anyone thus far of those who have come to this country who does not confess and frankly admit that the savages are more intelligent than our ordinary peasants, unquote. Unfortunately, however, appreciation of the remarkable lack of racism in these 17th century writings has been confounded by the terminology they often employed to describe indigenous people, les sauvages. This term from the Latin sylvaticus, forest inhabitants, is perhaps best translated as the more neutral wild men or wild ones than the pejorative sounding savages. Properly contextualized, this term eloquently demonstrates French ethnocentrism rather than racism. Their assumption that indigenous people having ni foi, ni loi, ni roi, no king, no religion, no laws, were essentially cultureless and living in a state of nature. This is what they thought in any case. These then are the writers who mediated the encounter between our speakers, indigenous people, and our European readers in old France. But how reliable are their writings as a source of ethnographic information about indigenous people? Really, there's two schools of thought about this. Some see the distinctive perspectives and prejudices of European writers as being so deeply dyed into these writings that they all but vitiate their usefulness as a helpful source of information about Indigenous people. Others see the sources less as dyed in the wool cloth than as something like a blueberry muffin, in which the obvious prejudices of the writers can easily be identified and removed, or like raisins and oatmeal raisins. <laughs> Missionaries detailed careful reporting of Indigenous beliefs, rituals, and perspectives, they argue, can quite easily be separated from their often caustic commentaries on them. Members of this more optimistic school also note the sheer quantity of colonial writing, noting the propensity of writers to contradict themselves in telling ways that amply reward careful forensics. So for example, in this book, what I found is that Paul Lejeune lied. He said that the shaman Karagonan had it out for him and always hated him as a representative of Christ and hated Christianity. But in fact, when we read uh, Lejeune attentively, we find things like Karagonan asking Lejeune, could you per perhaps heal me because I've got this really bad venereal disease? Could you take care of my wife who's sick? Could you tell me more about this guy, Jesus? Karagonan was actually far more interested in Christianity than Lejeune lets on, but because he writes so much, he, he gives away things uh, that perhaps he shouldn't have. There are also powerful pragmatic arguments for accepting these sources. If we ever hope to write about indigenous lives in the deep past, with anything approaching the degree of nuance and detail expended on the lives of colonial Europeans, such as Marie de l'Incarnation, Jean de Brébeuf, Pierre Esprit Radisson, then we must mine these admittedly imperfect sources, carefully analyzing them and supplementing them with indigenous oral narratives and archeological evidence. So now let's turn to our indigenous speakers. Those individuals whose words have been preserved for posterity in these sources that form one of our main windows into the deep past. Our speakers come from diverse indigenous nations along the eastern seaboard of North America and along the St. Lawrence River inland to the interior. Some, like the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat, are sedentary matrilocal agriculturalists. Others, like the Innu, are migratory hunter-gatherers who assemble in large riverside groups during the summer and then break into smaller hunting bands during the difficult winter months. Characterized by different languages, customs, aesthetics, mythology, beliefs, and rituals, these diverse indigenous nations nevertheless share certain important ideological similarities. All, for example, see themselves as living in an essentially personalistic universe 
in which human beings were not the sole moral actors in a spiritually denuded universe. All natural elements from animals to rocks, rivers, and the seasons themselves were seen as having powerful, ambiguous personalities characterized by emotions, individuality, humor, intelligence, and volition. All beings were seen as having essentially amoral powers and proclivities that they could choose to use selfishly or selflessly for their own aggrandizement or for the greater good of the group. Fittingly then, the rules of engagement for human interactions within communities, rules that communicated respect, non-interference, and the assiduous avoidance of conflict were extended outward into the natural world. Hunting was not a demonstration of prowess, but an act of courtly diplomacy in which humans persuaded animals to lay down their lives to nourish the community, promising them praise, gratitude, gifts, respect, and the strict observation of hunting taboos in exchange. Whereas Christianity saw the soul as unique to human beings, the mark of those made in the image of God, <clears throat> Indigenous people saw human beings and animals as sharing essentially the same internal architecture. Both had not just one, but several souls. One was an animating soul, maintaining the functions of the body, like breathing, the beating of the heart, all the things that keep us going. And the other was a voyaging soul that could detach itself to float free at night in dreams. Dreams were valued in many indigenous cultures as immediate firsthand experience of the world. They allowed communication with the spirits of animals and other beings, facilitated insight into the events of the future, and permitted the solution of pressing problems. Centuries before Freud, Indigenous people saw dreams as revealing hidden urgent desires, the fulfillment of which was necessary to restore them to full health. 17th century Indigenous people saw body and soul less as competing concepts than as a single experiential unit. Feeling that strong emotions like anger and jealousy could have dangerous implications for community cohesion and the individual's own health. They discouraged their open expression. In 1633, an Inu man named Manitugache, it's actually the older brother of my main uh, historical figure in, the, in this book, gently counseled the touchy, irascible Jesuit superior, Paul Lejeune, with the following words, quote, Mykonos, my well-beloved, do not be cast down, for anger brings on sadness, and sadness, sickness." End quote. In sharp contrast with the absolute monarchies of Europe and with papal supremacy, the indigenous people of the colonial Northeast were proto-democratic. Though some native nations were more hierarchical than others, all were considerably more participatory than were the nations of Europe at the time. Personal authority was persuasive and conditional, as no one had the right to impose himself or herself on anyone else, and leaders rose to power through rhetorical skill and reputation. The status of women varied considerably from nation to first nation. It was highest among agricultural groups, such as the Haudenosaunee, who were reliant for much of their diet upon the three sisters, corn, squash, and beans, raised by their communities, largely female farmers. The Haudenosaunee were matrilineal and matrilocal. An individual's line, logically, was traced through the mother, and husbands relocated to live with their new wife's kin following marriage. Haudenosaunee women were included in every decision in the political, diplomatic, and military life of their nations, and played an especially prominent role in deciding when to go to war and when to relocate their villages. Even in less egalitarian Indigenous cultures, women enjoyed considerably more sexual autonomy than did French women of the same era. 
young people were free to embark on a series of sexual relationships prior to marriage, though ties between a couple were expected to deepen once children appeared on the scene. Marriage was not indissolvable, but could be terminated by either partner should the spouses find themselves deeply estranged or wholly incompatible. In some, though not all indigenous cultures, homosexuality was also accepted, even embraced. Finally, the legitimacy of children was not the burning issue in Native North America that it was in Europe, as indigenous peoples thought it both cruel and illogical to penalize children for parentage not of their choosing. The autonomy of children was also valued and education was carefully designed so as not to infringe unduly upon a youngster's self-determination and autonomous discovery. Direct instruction was thus ensued in favor of more oblique methods of demonstration, observation, and imitation. Though often used by the French, Corporal punishment in pedagogical contexts was seen by indigenous peoples as far more suited to the treatment of enemy others than to the community's beloved children. Noted one Jesuit in 1634, quote, these barbarians cannot bear to have their children punished, nor even scolded, not being able to refuse anything to a crying child, unquote. Unlike Christian conceptions of the afterlife, which stress the moral evaluation of the dead soul and its consequent consignment to a place of heavenly reward, infernal torment, preparatory purgation, indigenous notions of the afterlife reunited the community both in this life and the next. Reunion could occur either in the shadowy afterworld, located in the far west, where the sun set, or through a soul's return to a new earthly body, that of a newborn babe or of a war captive. But for all the real and important contrast between them, 17th century Indigenous and European thought did share one crucial conception. Each group was convinced that individual and collective change was possible across cultural, linguistic, and ethnic lines. Neither group saw any inherent differences in the strangers that they encountered that could preclude their adoption. Both then saw cultural and religious belonging and identity as essentially behavioral and thus volitional rather than as an immutable ethnic given. Both boasted powerful rituals that could effectively transform strangers into kin positing a kind of symbolic rebirth or soul shift that literally and objectively remade the individual from one of them into one of us. In indigenous contexts, war captives became the living vessel used to contain a soul returning from the land of the dead to this land of the living. During the colonial period, indigenous incorporative adoption simply expanded to include Europeans and occasionally Africans captured in warfare. A captive's non-indigenous ethnicity was not seen as presenting a barrier to his or her ritual incorporation into the victorious body politic or to their social advancement once adopted. What counted was a factor wholly within a captive's control, their behavior. If an adoptee respected their adoptive nation's behavioral norms, then he or she was accepted as a member of the group. Ritual adoption then effectively conferred and enacted indigenous identity. Baptism served as a similar mechanism of identity transformation for Christians. Like adoption, it involved a name change and was seen as being objectively efficacious, having profound, irresistible effects upon an individual's soul and crucial implications for its ultimate destiny. Strikingly, Indigenous and European motivations for ritually transforming strangers into friends were identical, sheer need 
European Christians, we will recall, were in the New World in an effort to supplement their numbers, mm -hmm. as each confession struggled for global dominance with rival factions of the faith. For their part, Indigenous nations sought the replenishment of their numbers due to massive losses suffered in warfare and pandemics triggered by newly arrived Europeans. So how did Indigenous peoples react to Christianity? Faced with missionaries' persistent calls for their conversion, they evolved a number of responses, both to the positioning of Christianity as a universal truth incumbent on all humanity, as well as to the specific contents of the faith. The spirit of engagement and pointed questions of Indigenous interlocutors took missionaries completely off guard. Accustomed to the marked deference of lay Catholics in France, priests were quick to condemn what they called Native peoples pride, an elastic term referring to a constellation of tra traits, intellectual independence, perception of the missionaries their equals, love of open debate and eloquent rhetoric, and sharp condemnation of coercion, wrote a highly offended Jesuit Paul Lejeune in 1634, quote, the savages being filled with errors are often haughty and proud. Humility is born of truth, vanity of error and falsehood. They imagine that they ought by right of birth to enjoy the liberty of wild ass colts rendering no homage to anyone whomsoever except when they like they have reproached me 100 times because we fear our captains while they laugh and make sport of theirs all of their authority of their chief is in his tongue's end he is powerful only as long as he is eloquent end quote in G uh, indigenous debaters challenge christian claims to universality by touting religious relativism, denying their people's involvement in the instigating events of the Christian faith, and by holding Christian conceptions to strict standards of empirical evidence. Let's explore each of these in turn. First, religious relativism. Nothing frustrated missionaries more than when indigenous people treated the gospel truth as merely one religious option among many arguing that different people had distinctive beliefs and customs adapted to their unique cultures. Jesuit Pierre Biard, writing from Acadia in 1616, related ruefully, quote, For all of your arguments, and you can bring a thousand of them if you wish, are annihilated by the single shaft which they always had on hand, ayat chabai. This is the savage way of doing it. You can have your own way, we shall have ours. Everyone values his own wares." End quote. Rather than attempting to convert one another, people with different beliefs should simply respect one another's choices and coexist peacefully, they argued. Indigenous people were quick to observe and <clears throat> condemn the intense interconfessional hatred and rivalry that existed between Catholics and Protestants who competed to convert them. On this basis, they concluded that Christianity's putative message of peace on earth, goodwill towards men could generously be described as aspirational rather than actual. Said one Mi'kmaq man, quote, <coughs> you are always fighting and quarreling amongst yourselves. We live peaceably. You are envious and all the time slandering each other and are neither generous nor kind. As for us, if we have a morsel of bread, we share it with our neighbor. Indigenous people also resisted their repositioning within the supposedly universal Catholic drama of damnation, repentance, and salvation by stating that, quote, they knew nothing of the matter, unquote. The Christian God-man's death on the cross, while unfortunate, was really none of their affair, quote, for he did not come here. Unquote. It was Europeans who should be ashamed, Native people intimated, for it was they who had killed their own savior long ago on a far distant continent. The whole sorry drama had absolutely nothing to do with them, then languishing in a hemisphere as yet undiscovered. 
Finally, indigenous people blunted Christian claims of universalism with a trenchant empiricism, feeling that their own beliefs and rituals, which were participatory, adaptive, and experienced near, were supported evidentially by what they could see, hear, and feel for themselves, Native people sought to hold Christian claims to the same evidential standards. Frustrated missionaries frequently reported Indigenous demand for actual evidence of Christian claims. In 1634, an Inu shaman boldly challenged a Jesuit missionary by stating, quote, when I see him, God, I will believe in him, and not until then. How can I believe in him whom I do not see?" Unquote. As well as attacking missionaries' assumptions regarding the universalism of their Catholic creed, and by implication their evangelical imperative, Indigenous peoples also questioned the actual contents of Christianity. Many Indigenous people saw Catholic anthropology and theology with its sharp, static, dyads of saint and sinner, good and evil, as unconvincingly simplistic. Many could not reconcile their own complex self-image with the unsatisfyingly one-dimensional concept of sinner. Some 125 years before Rousseau, in a meal, penned the ringing challenge, there is no original sin in the human heart. A young Innu woman had already undermined in one fell swoop both the Felix and the culpa of traditional justifications for the incarnation, reported a frustrated Jesuit. Quote, when I was exhorting her to be sorry for having offended God and telling her that without doing so, her sins would not be pardoned her, she answered me that she could not do it for she had not offended God and that she did not know what sin was, unquote. Hell and its sufferings formed the dark centerpiece of Christian evangelism in 17th century North America. Focusing on hell made eminent sense to Europeans of both confessions, given both the prominence of eternal punishment in both Protestantism and Catholicism, and the very urgency that saving souls from this horrid end gave to evangelization. In Europe, hell was something of a trump card reducing all and sundry to frightened silence and a salutary admission of their own trembling culpability. And so it was only natural for missionaries to assume wrongly that the same would be true of native hearts and minds. Throughout the 17th century then, missionaries earnestly wrote home begging for more and better pictures of hell. In 1637, a Jesuit opined quote, heretics, by which he meant, of course, Protestants, are very much in the wrong to condemn and destroy representations which have so good an effect. If someone would depict three, four, five demons tormenting one soul with different kinds of tortures, one applying the torch, another serpents, another pinching it with red hot tongs, this would have a very good effect, especially if everything were very distinct and if rage and sadness appeared plainly in the face of the lost soul." End quote. But for Indigenous people, hell opened up a Pandora's box of questions, ranging from the true nature of God to the precise mechanics of hell. Many were quick to question how God's purported mercy and compassion could be squared with his desire to punish the recalcitrant forever. Indeed, some compared the Almighty unfavorably with their enemies, noting that even they would only torture war captives for a matter of hours or days, but not for eternity. <laughs> Others wondered why God did not end hell forever, simply by preemptively forgiving Satan and his dark legions, reasoning, quote, if God is so good, it is to be supposed that he would have pity on the demons if they trusted in him." End quote. Still others took a great offense at missionary attempts to frighten them into religious submission. Raised in cultures that greatly valued Stoicism and which trained people from a young age to withstand possible future torture with fortitude, 
that would reflect glory on their NATO culture, they bridled at such cheap intimidation. Quote, the father threatened him with the judgment of God. He answered that he could as well endure the fires in hell as he had borne the cold all winter, <laughs> end quote. Some went as far as boldly daring the missionaries or God himself to throw them down into hell so they could demonstrate their fortitude. <laughs> Others closed themselves in the dark power of the devil strategically. Said one shaman, I am a demon who lived underground in the house of the demons. Still others questioned the courage of Christian converts, casting them as cowards. For still others, more dispassionate in their analysis, help presented a range of fascinating technical issues. Recounted an exasperated Jesuit, Joseph Juvencé, in 1611, quote, when they first heard of the eternal fire and burning decreed as punishment for sin, they were marvelously impressed. But still they obstinately withheld their belief because, as they said, there could be no fire where there was no wood. <laughs> then what forest could sustain so many fires through such a great long space of time? End quote. What philosoph would not adore a question like this? And fittingly then, it is to the philosophs that we now turn, exploring at long last our third group, European readers. Any text taking colonial Canada as its subject was practically guaranteed to become a bestseller in early modern France. Readers eagerly gobbled up accounts of the dramatic, daunting Canadian wilderness. The very popularity of these accounts, I'm arguing, made them powerful transmitters of indigenous philosophies and epistemologies back to the old world. That these texts succeeded in doing this is quite amazing, seeing as this was far from what they were intended to do. To be sure, a few colonial texts can be characterized as purposeful defenses of indigenous culture, notably La Hontan's Dialogue avec un sauvage, and Radisson's voyage. But popular missionary author texts generally gloried in presenting their priestly writers as the heroic put upon bearers of civilization and Christianity to blithely uncooperative, stubbornly ungrateful indigenous peoples. Their cosmopolitan French readership, however, seems to have been just as adept as contemporary ethno historians in reading missionary narratives across and against the grain, rather than being passively guided by the Jesuits' interpretations of indigenous beliefs and practices. They were able to read past and through the stance of their missionary mediators to absorb the often profound critiques made by native people about European social mores and the inconsistencies of Christian beliefs. Over the passage of a century then, Jesuit religious exclusivism and ethnocentrism would gradually be rejected by their French readership in favor of the relativistic, tolerant, and democratic indigenous cultures described on their very pages as a progressive model for a new Europe. Concrete evidence of the philosophes' counter-reading of colonial texts may be found in their often playful imitation of them in their own creative efforts. Time constraints this evening limit us to examining just one rich example, the Enlightenment classic L'Ingenue, Voltaire's popular novella about the arrival of a hapless Huron on French shores. While it touches on the <laughs> themes as early colonial texts upon which it was obviously based, L'Ingenue <laughs> reverses earlier attributions of praise and blame. Rather than censuring Indigenous pride, as had the Jesuits, Voltaire celebrates this very tendency. Hercule, his Huron character, declares boldly, I always speak as I think and act as I like. For Voltaire, Hercule's forthright determination to speak his mind to anyone, anywhere, regardless of their social level or religious background, make him an admirable, enlightened hero rather than a churlish colonial villain. Like the real-life Indigenous speakers of the earlier colonial texts, 
Voltaire's fictional Hercule, quote, sometimes proposed difficulties that greatly embarrassed the prior, unquote. Indeed, many of his criticisms are directly inspired by those made by real indigenous interlocutors and written down by the missionaries. Like them, Hercule demands, quote, is not an all-powerful being who permits evil virtually the author of that evil, end quote. For Voltaire, this poised, passionate Canadian skeptic of his own creation, meeting his various interlocutors, Recollet, Protestant, <laughs> Jesuit, Jansenist, in a defense of equals, has a fresh frankness to be admired and emulated as he and the other philosophers sought to create a new intellectual environment in which they could do the same. Lest his reader miss Voltaire's point that indigenous cultures provide an alternative model for French society, he dramatically reveals in chapter three that Hercule is not actually Huron by birth, but rather by adoption, having been only raised in Canada by his Wendat nurse following the untimely death of his Breton parents. In unanimity with the colonial sources that were his undoubted model then, Voltaire here reiterates one of their central contentions, that no ethnic barriers existed to effectively becoming Indigenous. For Voltaire, the revolutionary implication is that the French of the old world, soif de la liberté and longing to escape the suffocating embrace of Catholic theocracy, could effectively decide to remake themselves as French Huron if they, like Hercule, could have the courage to undergo a self-directed, self-conscious process of questioning everything they think they know. <clears throat> Openly envious of Indigenous people's cultural and religious outsiderhood and freedom of thought, Voltaire writes of his hero, Hercule, quote, he saw things as they were, whereas the ideas that are communicated to us in our infancy make us see all of, the, all of our life in a false light, end quote. The reversal is complete as now religious education championed as a means of salvation by missionaries to New France is now blamed by philosophers for enacting a kind of false consciousness that actually precludes social development by foreclosing original thought. For Voltaire and his fellow philosophers, Native people's steadfast religious relativism and commitment to toleration spoke eloquently to the key concerns of an old world, exhausted by centuries of theological wrangling and sickened by bloody confessional warfare, whose violence betrayed the very values hallowed by the most important yet least followed precepts of their participants' shared Christian faith. Through Hercule, Voltaire urges the French to follow indigenous people in rejecting the very notion of a singular religious truth. For in rejecting religious exclusivism, society also evades its accompanying dark duty, the persecution of dissent. Now, let's turn to 19th century Canada. This era marked a fateful turning point in the history of Indigenous peoples in this country. Following the War of 1812, Indigenous people were, for the first time, collectively outnumbered by whites, a tipping point that had occurred much earlier in New England. With this demographic shift, the fragile middle ground of Entente was replaced by the frank coercion of Indigenous people. In this era, reserves were created, the hated past system was instituted, and world-maintaining Native rituals such as the potlatch and the Sundance were outlawed. Most fatefully of all, in 19th century Canada, Indigenous people came to be perceived and presented as a distinct racial group that was both sharply distinct from and inferior to whites, notions notably absent, as we have seen, from 17th century European writing. This mirrored similar developments in the United States, where white slaveholders had come belatedly to realize the danger that sharing a religious identity with those who they claimed to own might pose for the institution of slavery. 
New scholarship has eloquently shown how 19th century American whites created racial hierarchies, largely as a bulwark against attacks made on the peculiar institution on the scriptural basis of spiritual equality. In Canada too, whites sought to evade the commitment to religious fraternity and equality implicit in shared Christian identity by conveniently postulating essential racial differences between themselves and Indigenous people. This new racialist mentality was enshrined in some of the first pieces of legislation penned in post-Confederation Canada, the Indian Act of 1876, which framed the identity of Indigenous people firmly in racial terms, establishing blood quantum as the definitive way of measuring an individual's Indigenous identity, as it remains even today. This audacious challenge to traditional behavioral articulations of Indigenous identity has proven to be so successful over the last 146 years that early volitional notions stressing behavior over blood today languish largely forgotten. This new assessment of Indigenous people as inherently racially inferior had a number of fateful effects, though tonight we can consider only two. First, it undercut the recognition of the role that Indigenous people had played as agents of modernity in European intellectual history. At the very moment that enough historical perspective had developed to enable the appreciation of Indigenous contributions to the Enlightenment then, powerful racial currents effectively precluded this realization. Popular sentiment, in fact, mandated the contrary that Europeans, as a supposedly superior race, take up the paternalistic white man's burden of tutoring their inferior brethren. Canadians would heed this call, tragically, by reintroducing institutions whose inefficacious cruelty had led to their eventual rejection two centuries earlier, residential schools. Sadly, modern residential schools would prove to be even more damaging than their 17th century predecessors. For one thing, their scale was far larger. Many, many more Indigenous children were incarcerated. For another, in 1920, enrollment in these assimilative institutions was mandated under Canadian law and attendance enforced by all the powers of the state. But perhaps the most damaging aspect of these new schools was the punishing psychological double bind they presented to their students. For in them, the universalist, optimistic, and ethnocentric mantra of 17th century schools, that all that was wrong with indigenous people could be fixed by their conversion to Christianity, was now added a contradictory, exclusivistic, pessimistic, and racist message that even religious conversion could never completely erase or compensate for inherent racial inferiority. So it didn't make any sense, even under its own assumptions. Ironically, however, the very century that witnessed this dramatic downturn in the fortunes of Canada's Indigenous people would also see the belated adoption of prescient Indigenous critiques of the faith first articulated in the 17th century outside the church too, in fields as diverse as psychology, medicine, and the sciences, theories were articulated that would gradually bring the West into closer approximation of the precocious modernity of 17th century Indigenous people. Even as Indigenous fortunes were at their nadir, a new wave of their influence was beginning to form. Four, it was in the 19th century that long-standing Indigenous concerns about hell finally found an answering uneasiness in the hearts and minds of Canadian Christians. For the first time, members of mainstream congregations dared publicly to question the justice of eternal punishment in hell and the character of a God who would demand it. In fact, some of hell's most animated critics were liberal leading Protestant ministers several of whom were put on trial for heresy by church boards during the 1870s when they refused as a matter of conscience to teach or preach the doctrine. It is hard to overemphasize what an ethical change this was in Christian thought. 
In the medieval era, Thomas Aquinas gloated, quote, the blessed in the kingdom of heaven will see the punishments of the damned in order that their bliss might be more delightful to them. End quote. Even in the 17th century, as we've seen, missionaries constantly demanded yet more graphic depictions of the eternal tortures awaiting the damned on the basis that, quote, fear is the forerunner of faith in these barbarous <coughs> minds, unquote. The emphasis on God's compassion over his righteous wrath since the 1870s has gradually become a comfortable new normal. With today's spiritual great inflation, many Christians blithely anticipate the joys of heaven in a way unthinkable to their 17th century forebears. Many, many contemporary Christians would doubtless second the urgings of an anonymous Wendat man in 1637. Quote, do not speak to us of those fires, for it disgusts us. Speak to us of the blessings of heaven, of living a long time here below, of living at our ease, the pleasures that we will have after our death, for it is by this that men are won. Those threatening words do not serve at all to that end." Unquote. Christianity was not alone in catching up during this pivotal century with the indigenous thought of centuries past. In more secular spheres too, theories that echoed earlier indigenous ideas were independently articulated for the first time by Europeans. The notion of hidden dimensions of the self and appreciation of dreams as a rich source of information about the mysterious motivations of the human heart, familiar concepts in many indigenous cultures now bubbled to the top of European consciousness. They were most fully articulated, of course, by a quirky Austrian, whose theories forever undercut humanity's ability fully to obey Socrates' famous dictum, know thyself. But indigenous con uh, contentions of the essentially symbi symbiotic relationship between mind and body, in which emotional well-being profoundly affects physical health, have even today one only partial acceptance in a West still profoundly marked by Cartesian dualism. Finally, the same era that witnessed the bastardization of his theories into a hateful so-called social Darwinism also saw the increasing influence of Darwin's actual theory, which articulated in scientific terms key elements of a long-held Indigenous credo that human beings are enmeshed in a wider web of in interconnected life upon which they depend and to which they are intimately interrelated. In our own times, these indigenous themes of the fundamental interrelation of all Earth's living beings are out of dire necessity finding a new audience. Their urgent relevance only heightened by the harsh realities of climate change and global environmental crisis. Indigenous activists and scientists alike are urging us to join them in fighting, not simply for our own survival, but that of our wider other than human family. As the title of Nick Estes book, Our History is the Future intimates, the only way forward is by going back, back to traditional indigenous ways of being in the world. As I draw towards the end of my presentation this evening, it's time to ask ourselves, what are the larger takeaways from tonight? There are several, I think. The first is not all eras of colonialism are the same. It is my hope that if you take anything at all from tonight's talk, it will be how different colonialism was in Canada in the 17th century, when it was focused largely around religion, and in the 19th, when it was focused around race. Conflating these two eras paints a false picture of early French colonization that fundamentally distorts its demographic realities, robs 17th century Indigenous people of their agency, and continues to obscure, to our, own law, our collective loss, their seminal contributions to world history. Secondly, history is not inherently progressive in nature as much as we would long to believe that it is. There is nothing inevitable about human progress through time. If we want to move forward, we have to work at it. History is not an obliging escalator. <laughs>
Thirdly, though this may seem like an obvious point, it does bear repeating. The indigenous people and European Christians who encountered one another in 17th century Canada are profoundly different from the members of these same groups today. This is partly because of the impact of centuries of history on how each group defines and experiences their collective identity, and partly because of the profound influence that each group has had and will continue to have on the other. Put somewhat differently, a given culture's understanding of the nature of its identity changes greatly over time. It can be seen as being wholly within an individual's control, as when identity was defined in performative or behavioral terms by both Indigenous people and European Christians in the 17th century. Alternatively, identity can be seen as something fixed, mutable, inherent, and beyond the control of the individual whom it defines, as it was in the 19th century. This very variability should show us these definitions are essentially choices. They are not immutable. They are not eternal. They're only cultural. Fourthly, and finally, what we call history, I would argue, is simply an ongoing conversation, a vast process of cultural appropriation, because at its base, history is simply transformative encounters between people. It is thus impossible, as well as deeply artificial, to try to teach the history of one group in isolation from all others. Cultures shape, affect, and transform one another through contact by a complex process of imitation, appropriation, and reaction. These processes are inevitable, ongoing, and unpredictable. They are also deeply fascinating and they have made Canada and the world of today what they are, for better or for worse. Like the philosophes of the 18th century then, we too are living during a period of profound Indigenous influence. Key traditional beliefs of Indigenous cultures articulated in their early colonial conversations with the French have increasingly become, particularly over the past 70 years, the new normal as the West belatedly catches up to the precocious modernity of 17th century Indigenous people. Today, the West looks to Indigenous culture for its ontology. But this is at least in part because the intellectual freedom, religious relativism, and prove it empiricism that Indigenous people imparted to Europeans in the 17th and 18th centuries has been so successfully recast in Western terms that we think it is the pure fruit of our own enlightenment. Thank you. That is into that fascinating, complicated, provocative, uh, and, and sort of immensely creative presentation. Um, I, I think we were we're running close to our end time, so I think we have time for maybe one or two questions, and then and then we uh, will break. And of course, there's still uh, food and beverages, and we will have time to talk. Um, so please, yeah. So thank you. That was great to talk here. Yeah, I think that's okay. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much. That that was really interesting. There's so much I think to write there to unpack, but I wanted to go back to the contrast between Jesuit European ethnocentrism and religious exclusivism and the, the indigenous contrast. And I'm wondering how that's supposed to square with your vision of, with your explanation of how the North American martyrs are killed and what happens to them when they're within the indigenous context. So if I follow the line of thought in your death and afterlife correctly, the reasons why martyrs like Isaac Shog are killed is because they refuse to integrate with the Iroquois culture, they're thus labeled as dangerous outsiders, sorcerers, witches, and so on. And then they need to be killed. And at the same time, their religious activities like baptism come to be viewed, at least by a minority of people, as you know, marking the dead uh, by way of a watery cross. I think that's the way you describe it in your book. So the refusal of people like Isaac Job to integrate into indigenous sociocultural structures leads to them either needing to be cast out of the community or be killed. But that starts to sound an awful lot to me, like the sort of ethnocentric religious intolerance that was supposed to be the European model you were contrasting indigenous culture with. 
So, so how do we take the vision of indigenous culture that you were giving us tonight and square it with your explanation of the North American martyrs? Wow, what a creative and awesome question. I love it. <laughs> well, really, when we think about um, so post-war um, fates, it's really a T-junction. And fortunately for us in the period that we're looking at, so 1630s coming into the 1640s, many, many more people are going to take the left turn into adoption and be having a new life as the kind of container for somebody else's soul with a new name and everything, then turning right and ending up tortured and killed. But I don't think it's a contradiction to say that Jesuit missionaries don't, um, don't kind of fit. When we think about what they were, what they were not allowed to do, it's basically almost everything that Indigenous men thought defined Indigenous manhood, right? So as a Jesuit, first we have to remember they've got priestly vows. So that means no sexual liaisons, perfect angelic chastity, etc. So that means they're not then going to be able to contribute to the sexual economy of the new adoptive Thing. This is profoundly unattractive, right? Who is going to pick someone who isn't going to take over that particular part of the, the new or the returning husband's responsibilities? It's, it's a problem. Then we have the fact that the Jesuits and other male missionaries were forbidden by their religious vows from either hunting or participating in warfare. So now you're supposed to feed a guy who is not going to contribute to the population of your um, of your nation, but also isn't going to defend it or feed it. This is starting to look more and more uh, problematic for their adoption. But then the final thing is the comportment of the missionaries. And I think probably the perfect way to think about it is that we have Guillaume Couture, who's captured during the very same raid as Isaac Shokes. And Guillaume Couture is a Catholic layman, quite pious, whereas Isaac Jogues is a full-fledged, ordained Jesuit. When Jogues is captured, and it's, it's a sad story, and it's one that has many, many chapters because he actually kind of prays for deliverance, and then he actually is delivered, and the Dutch kind of somewhat um, reluctantly ransom and, and rescue him, send him all the way back overseas to France. He meets Anne of Austria, who weeps over his mangled, uh, dismembered fingers, but then the call is too strong. He comes back over, immediately says that he'll go back to the country of his original capture and is almost immediately put to death. Uh, so when I think, is there a contradiction? It's more that there were some things that didn't work in terms of integration. So one of the things that I was careful to say, because of sneaky people like you in my <laughs> lecture, is that um, there are rules for this inclusion, just like there's rules on the Christian side for baptism. And I would say um, if there's an inconsistency, it's at least a uniform one on both sides, because we also have Jesuits able artificially to pick who they're going to bring into the church in a way that they never could have done in Europe, right? Because it's, you know, you're, you're a tiny baby when you're brought in, if you're a cradle Catholic. Whereas here, they're able almost, in, like Puritans, to make Native people testify and hold them to these almost un unbelievable standards of behavior before they'll bring them into the church. So I'm not so sure I would see it as a, as a contradiction, um, but it is thought provoking to show the limitations of tolerance on both sides. Thank you. One more question, and then we'll pray for, or we'll be the visual. Thank you for coming. Uh, first of all, this is a great, great talk. So I'm familiar with all the texts you're citing, but you, you bring them together and give them a fresh reading which I think is quite rare because some of these texts are really well known in French Canada, and yet that argument is not being made. So that's great. Um, I'm interested in what happens with the Jesuits after they realize that their writings are being put to use in, in a way that undermines the both evangelizing and, and sort of 
um, apologetic enterprise, right? So, and I'd be curious to hear you talk a bit about that, particularly what kind of move, how do they reinterpret um, indigenous realities to, to push against the, the new narratives that come from the philosophy and, 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 their, and their kind, so. That is a, also a really great question. And I'm not really sure how to respond to that because my research hasn't really gone there yet. But one thing I think that helped the Jesuits at least, because you think to yourself, imagine how horrible that would have been for them <laughs> to think, oh, we're writing all this material and it's actually being used to almost kind of prove the opposite. Mm -hmm. There's a movement in, or there's a moment in Europe where like we were talking about on our tour today, just the two of us, when we were saying, people started to think the liberty of wild ass cults sounds good to me. I want to be a wild ass cult. I'm tired of being docile. I'm tired of being humble. I want to be like these people that I'm reading about. But I don't think because of the time lag that it took, the Jesuits always were conscious of the way that their own readings were going to be counter read against them. At least they were spared that. Well, I think by the 18th century, you might start seeing it, right? It's only yeah. certain the 17th century, I think you're probably spot on, but I'd like to talk more about it. I think it's really, really yeah. interesting. It's true. And sometimes there are those those reversals. I think we can see that because um, I'm just thinking on the fly here about someone like Catherine de St. Augustine, for example, like when Paul Ragano is first writing her hagiography, this is a, a wonderful, wonderful woman who is not as well known as Marie de l'Incarnation, largely because a lot of her stuff hasn't been translated into English, making it more widely available for Canadian scholars, but especially our American friends too. But Catherine de St. Augustine is fascinating. She comes over when she's 16 years old. She's known to have all this, what they call demonic obsession, which is not quite possession, but kind of is close to demonic possession. And then she's almost sort of counter-possessed by these uh, spiritual forces like the North American martyrs, notably Jean de Brebeuf. Her, she's written about by Paul Ragano. And it's, there's a, a moment where the thing sort of turns into satire. The first decade that people are reading about her in the old world, it's all the conventional thing. What a saint, what an angel. Oh, you know, we should venerate her. And then there's that sort of moment where everything turns and it becomes ridiculed. And um, yeah, the, the philosophes sort of feast on the whole idea of someone who's mesmerized by the sight and smell of a rare lemon, but won't eat it, which was one of the most famous incidents in her hagiography. 
All right. So I think that, that we need to. Pre-